Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE on the ground. Covering KubeCon 2016. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Here's your host, John Furrier. Hello everyone, we are here in Seattle for special CUBE on the ground. I'm John Furrier, uh, thanks for watching. We're covering KubeCon and Cloud Native. This is uh, really one of the fastest growing conferences and, and events uh, around application developers and software open source. And of course, uh, we're here on the ground covering with theCUBE and our next guest is Richard Kaufman here inside theCUBE, Vice President of Samsung SDS. Welcome to theCUBE. Great to see you. It's great to be here. So Samsung, uh, obviously, a big player uh, at many levels. Um, what's what are you guys doing? What's the news for you guys here at KubeCon and Cloud Native? So first thing is we're Samsung SDS. We're an IT outsourcing company, part of the Samsung Group. There are a lot of companies. We're the IT outsourcing folks, and we're here for two reasons. One, we are uh, working very hard in Cloud Native. My part of Samsung SDS, and we do two things. We do services inside of Samsung Group where we help provide them and advice, all the way from high level advice and how they should go after it to deployment and service operation for Kubernetes based services. We also offer the same service outside of Samsung. We have a few customers in North America and we've leveraged this business up to the point where we want to very much go public with it and we also want to contribute significantly back to the community. So all of the work that we do, we put back into open source. Uh, where we've been uh, working on Kubernetes uh, for almost two years now. Uh, we were on stage at the 1.0 launch uh, doing some really interesting demonstrations and talks and uh, we also just now joined the, uh, the foundation, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So we're on the board and hoping to also contribute back to the community that way. A big uh, jump in attendance this year from last year, isn't it? Oh my heavens, you can't walk on the show floor yeah. without getting trampled. Yeah. Uh, I think that's in incredible. I think that it's the, the nice problem they have is how to figure out the size venue for a few years down the road and predict what kind of exponential growth they have. I, and it's I a nice nice mix of people too. It's like you have a lot of developers and builders out there who are doing this. And you know, to me, the benchmark of a good conference like at this size, you can tell the, the heartbeat when the hallway conversations, the lobby's packed, people are talking. And they're not just smooching. They're, this, this real cool conversation. So you can feel the early momentum of what Kubernetes and containers has done to the application developer worlds. Now, this is blending in with IT because now the IT guys have to connect to the businesses. Right. So you guys have been doing that. So take a minute to explain SDS and Samsung relative to obviously the, the parent company, Samsung. How big are you guys? Uh, what's the status? You guys are a public company. Right. What's your role? What are you guys doing? Do you have a cloud? Give us some color. Spend a minute to describe SDS. So uh, SDS is um, a very small company in the Samsung group, $7.2 billion in revenue last year. So that's small. <laughs> uh, we uh, are quite large uh, and have operations most countries in the world. A lot of our work is inwardly facing into the other Samsung Group companies. So we're independently publicly traded. We compete for business. We also serve as customers outside of Samsung Group. But uh, a lion's share of our, our revenue comes from within the group. And uh, in North America, we service Samsung Electronics America, but uh, all the other group companies as well, mm -hmm. uh, when we can earn their business. And uh, I'm part of an outfit called SDS Research America. Uh, we uh, work on things ranging from machine learning to cloud native technologies. My little part of the turf is You're on the front end doing, you're kind of pioneering, getting out front, right. digging at, kicking the tires and all the new stuff. They, they hired us so that uh, we could help them with infrastructure software technologies that would be relevant two to five years down the road. So we have a set of projects that address everything from short to long term interests that would help SDS. Well, congratulations, it's a great endorsement to the community, and uh, it's awesome to see you guys. I mean, it's $7 billion in revenue, it's small by your standards, but you know, literally look at Amazon, it's you know, almost catching up to those kinds of revenue numbers, it's pretty big. But really, this is about the future of this conference and a lot of work you do, and you mentioned Kubernetes, it's been a couple of years for you guys. What does this all mean for, for folks? Because the rah-rah hallway conversations, which we're seeing here, is a lot of people motivated because they can see a straight and narrow from a development standpoint. 
but now it's got to get operationalized in the enterprise. What's the impact for customers as they look at this? Is it the bridge between IT and business? Is, what's the net net? How do you see that? How would you describe that? So I think it's a strategy that if you look at it from the perspective of a potential customer of ours, so an IT shop that knows that they have to adapt to this, the reasons that they have to adapt to it, one is they need to achieve the same efficiencies of the Google and Facebooks of the world uh, in order to compete. The second is that new developers that they hire all know this stuff and don't know the legacy stuff. So at a certain point, uh, it would be like, uh, as a, in a previous talk, somebody talked about, yeah, good luck finding a COBOL programmer. Yeah. It, in the next few years, it's good luck finding somebody who understands traditional virtual machines as opposed to, to cloud native technologies. So the, uh, from this perspective of, a, of an IT provider, um, how do we both figure out how to make the new apps, the Greenfield apps, happy on this sort of technology. How do we host it? What kind of strategy do we have for running on other people's clouds? And how do we bridge this with our legacy stuff? And the uh, Kubernetes is good because it provides a, a way to run this sort of technology in a way that's cloud provider independent. You can run it internally or externally without getting locked into one provider or your own inf your own vendor choices. Um, the second reason is if you sort of adopt the overall techniques, you can um, deploy changes rapidly, so you can turn your applications over quickly. You can also scale them up and down depending on workloads, and you can run quite efficiently. Those three things are, are very important. Uh, and then finally, especially for a company that's running critical applications like Samsung Group does quite often, uh, these applications, when you deploy them, they know how to heal themselves. And so outages that come from people mm -hmm. fat fingering services, those that, that source of failures is gone. Yeah, the automation kind of kicks in, but this is interesting too. There's also kind of a chessboard going on here where you have Kubernetes providing that multi-cloud capability, which is nice from a uh, hedge perspective or you know multi-cloud perspective, but also puts pressure on Amazon Web Services and Microsoft and others to actually get better because if the switching costs become almost zero, the competition shifts down below the stack for the cloud guys. I mean, you're already seeing Amazon have Kubernetes. It's not native in ECS, but right. this is interesting dynamic. Your thoughts on that landscape shift, if you will, if Kubernetes continues to you know, go get the momentum it's getting, it should have an impact on forcing the major cloud guys to get stronger, better at the lower end of the stacks. Right, so the, um, that's a, a fantastic question. And from the perspective of our coast customers, both inside Samsung and outside Samsung, our interest is in allowing them to be as flexible as possible without getting locked into a one cloud provider might actually be a competitor of theirs at some point. So don't get locked in for strategic reasons, don't get locked in for financial reasons, but also don't get locked in for geographic reasons. Uh, Samsung is an exceptionally global company, yeah. and if we need to go into Africa, we need to go into Africa, and it doesn't matter whether one cloud provider yeah. is there or not. We need to be able to deploy there when we want. And with Kubernetes, you don't have to make the application changes That's at all. Absolutely correct, and even if it makes sense, you can run your service across multiple providers simultaneously. So this is the nirvana for the, the kind of the, the punchline of flexibility. We hear that a lot from vendors. Right. We're going to offer flexibility. I mean, come on, they can't get any more flexible than this. Right. I, I, it's wonderful when you can sell something <laughs> as nirvana. We hope to get close. <laughs> well, it's still early days, but we're seeing some forking going on. You know, VMware, for instance. But I don't want to go there. Again, the 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 the, 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 the market will adjust. But the bottom line is, developers need to have this. Your thoughts on 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 the staying power of this mission? How long do you think it's going to going to last, and will it continue? So uh, a very very positive sign is that the number two contributor to Kubernetes is everybody else. So forty something percent Google, forty three percent was unidentified. That means individuals either from a company that they didn't bother saying what company they were from, or actual users. So that's huge. The fact that it's gone in one year from being essentially a Google project to being a plurality Google, but majority other folks, and most of the other folks were miscellaneous developers working on it. So it's a wide that's ecosystem. That's a good proof point on one, authenticity of the, of the opportunity. Right. And two, 
the checks and balances of this becoming a marketing program for people who are trying to Kubernetes wash their strategy and say we have that too. <laughs> so uh, the nice thing about this is that the hype is matched with reality. There are a number of services that are up and running using Kubernetes. We have some. Pokemon Go runs on Kubernetes. So there's actually a there there. And we have an open source project called Kraken that's on GitHub. Anybody can download it. It allows you to quickly get this stuff running up on Amazon. Uh, and Pokemon uh, Go, talk about that for a second, because that's interesting. That's, how is that being orchestrated? Give me an example of some of so, the services that they're uh, using. So this is Google's story and Pokemon Go's story. I'm just mm -hmm. referring to theirs. Okay. Uh, but Google Container Engine, which is a Kubernetes native service, uh, is hosting Pokemon Go. Yeah. So that's huge, and you can imagine for something that's as successful as that, how the ability to flexibly grow and shrink the yeah. workload depending on, on the demand uh, has to be a huge benefit well, that's, to them. This is a great example that highlights your point about having the ability to move from one cloud to the other. If they need excess compute, for instance, they could move from whatever cloud they're on to wherever, and certainly the geography of uh, Pokemon Go highlights that. Right. And just the, um, if you think about uh, the Farmville folks years ago, uh, when they were you know, trying to figure out how to scale their service and they were on Amazon and they were on data centers, the, the, the difficulty that they had deploying infrastructure. One of the talks here you mentioned in the old days, if you wanted to spin up your bare metal infrastructure, it was to call your hardware sales rep and, and fight for a delivery slot three months later. Yeah. Now we're arguing In about a data center that has potentially availability zone issues in and of itself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a nightmare, basically. And now it's... Uh, Farmville meaning Zynga, the old, yeah, right. uh, the first generation game. Right. And the um, now we're in a situation where as we go from virtual machines, we were at minutes, now we're at seconds for starting up new instances. Richard, thanks so much and congratulations on your success. I'll give you the final word uh, here on this segment here, KubeCon and Cloud Native Con here in theCUBE. What's next? What do you see around the corner that potentially others might not see? You're ahead of the curve. What's what's coming next? So I think the uh, the, the linear predictions would be just for adjacencies, which would be better integration with storage and networking technologies, the kind of the mean potatoes boring enterprise stuff like chargeback yeah. and quotas Compliance. <laughs> and all the like. Uh, the more interesting thing farther down the road is integration with analytics, uh, both providing analytics services but also using it in every stage of operation. Uh, I think that's going to be a very exciting That's an opportunity area. for cloud guys also to differentiate too. The data analytics in the cloud potentially could be a big opportunity to cross subsidize some of that value. Absolutely, and you know, it, you're ne you never fail predicting that things will keep on climbing up the stack, so PaaS goes to software as a service, goes to higher level services uh, again, mm -hmm. so I think we'll continue to see more interesting integrations climbing up the stack. Final question, since it just popped in my head, to go to the final, final question. Velocity of code being pushed, just thoughts, what are you seeing out there? I'll see there's a demand for more and more Kubernetes folks, but just in the snapshot right now, what's the velocity of code being pushed here in this community? Uh, so the number of contributors is going way up, the quality of their contributions is going up, the need for the community to coordinate all of these actions is going up. Probably of the open source communities I've experienced, the the role that the leadership has in keeping everybody together, the meetup culture that's all in Zoom video calls. Most of us organize our lives around those community calls. I think the community is keeping itself together and helping to productively control the velocity of contributions and new projects. Uh, so Richard Kaufman here, uh, president of Samsung at SDS, independent public company, part of Samsung, but kind of not part of it, doing a lot of work. Gunesh, thanks for sharing your thoughts here on theCUBE, appreciate Thank it. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, we are here on the ground in Seattle for the CUBE special on the ground coverage of Kubernetes Con, called KubeCon, KubeCon, not to be accused of this CUBE, um, and Cloud Native Con. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. Ah!